Almost immediately, a first-year college student was discovered dead in her own bedroom. Any one of the police's numerous suspects could have been the murderer. The subsequent breakthrough was akin to a detective story with unexpected turns and a long-awaited revelation made possible by a small DNA sample. We'll explain what happened to Jennifer Halen in this video. Welcome to A to Z Crime Stories. Before we start, don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more. On February 23, 1988, Jennifer Allen was born in Wimberley, Texas, a tiny hamlet in the United States. She grew up carefree and content with adoring parents, a sister named Diana, and loving parents. Her family soon relocated to Bryan, a city located about 200 kilometers away from her village. The young lady enrolled in Blinn College in her hometown after graduating from high school with the intention of studying to become a legal assistant and hoping to make a connection with Jairus Prudence in her later years. She was well-liked, dependable, and friendly by a large number of her friends. She always had a positive outlook on things and was excited about her future career. Jenna moved into an apartment at Autumn Woods Apartments close to her college. She also took a job as a waitress in a nearby restaurant to help pay for housing costs and avoid being financially dependent on her parents in spite of his busy schedule juggling work and school. Spencer Hood, Jenna's boyfriend, and her were frequently together. Even after Jenna moved into a rented apartment, they continued to live apart despite having been in a relationship since high school. Despite occasional disagreements, the couple's relationship had lasted for a while. Jenna, who was 20 years old at the time, finished her shift on April 8, 2008 and Spencer said goodbye to Jenna and went home for about 30 minutes at around 9 p.m. because he had finished studying with her at around midnight. Then they had a brief phone conversation before saying goodnight to one another and retiring to bed. On the morning of April 9th, Spencer realized that he had left his textbook, which he needed for a lecture, at Jenna's house. When no one came to the door, he went to her house to get it. The fact that it was unlocked shocked Spencer. He entered Jenna's apartment, assuming she was still asleep, and went to her bedroom, only to be confronted by a horrifying sight. Jenna was aware that she was dead as she lay lifeless on the ground. Spencer sprinted over to the adjacent apartment and pleaded with the occupants to call the police. This call's recording is accessible to everyone. The operator was informed by Jenna's neighbor that she was lying on the floor, not breathing, and in the distance, Spencer's startled voice could be heard. When the police arrived, they checked the apartment and discovered no evidence of the fourth century. The second bedroom's window being open was the only peculiarity. Detectives assumed right away that the killer might have entered the building through it, but this theory was challenged because the door was unlocked. The theory of a potential robbery which might have prompted the perpetrator to attack Jenna, because all of her belongings were in their proper places, was immediately challenged by investigators. Nothing of value was missing, and her purse containing cash and credit cards was hanging right by the front door, which a thief would have undoubtedly taken. Additionally, the apartment was in perfect order. There were no visible signs of a struggle. There was no indication that the murderer had been there recently, and when the police examined Jana's body, they found no signs of serious injuries aside from a bruise on her forehead and a bit of lip. She was lying on her back. She had small blood stains on the carpet next to her body and on the collar of her shirt. Medical professionals examined the body and came to several significant conclusions. First, Jenna passed away just an hour after she finished speaking with Spencer on the phone, about 10 hours before Spencer found her. Second, the cause of death, strangulation, was discovered on her body. The experts also concluded that the unidentified offender did not sexually assault the young woman, but that Jenna attempted to repel him, as shown by her fingernails had skin and blood under them. All of these samples were right away delivered to the lab in an effort to collect a DNA sample from the offender. Spencer, her boyfriend, was naturally the first person to be suspected for a number of reasons. First, according to statistics, murderers frequently end up being people close to the victim. Second, the lack of any indications of a forced entry suggested that Jenna might have known the offender and knowingly permitted them entry. 
Spencer cooperated with the investigation during questioning and responded to all. The police could not confirm Spencer's involvement in the murder at the time because experts had not yet been able to obtain the killer's DNA sample. He was eventually set free, but the police took their time in clearing him of all charges. Jenna's friends, meanwhile, claimed that he loved her dearly and wasn't likely to have harmed his beloved. Detectives then started looking for potential witnesses. In order to determine whether Jenna's neighbors had observed anything, the police questioned them. They quickly located several men who were playing volleyball close to Jenna's apartment building on the night of the murder. They claimed to have seen a strange man at that time emerge from a building close to the young woman's apartment. The fact that this person was only sporting pants caught them off guard. The man appeared to be 26 years old, the witnesses continued. After learning about Jenna's friends, Sean Stevens, who also resided in the same apartment building, told the police about another concerning development in the past. Stevens, a real person, he yelled at Jenna from his window, directly across from her. Although the reason for this behavior was not entirely clear, the police had enough reason to suspect the young man Stevens based on all of these facts. He denied knowing anything about the murder and said he never left his apartment building at night, much less went outside in the open. Without any solid evidence, the police were unable to verify his claims, so they had to release him as well. Along with everything else, the detective looked at the potential. Although Jenna's restaurant co-workers and the surveillance cameras supported the theory that the murder was related to Jenna's place of employment, they also revealed that on the day of her death, she had no conflicts with anyone and that similar circumstances had never occurred before. The investigation slowed down after this. The police kept looking for new leads and questioned Jenna's family and friends. Eventually, they were able to get a new lead while speaking with the detectives. Parents of the young woman were able to recall crucial details from two months prior to Jenna's murder that might implicate another suspect. She complained about a repairman performing maintenance on her apartment complex building to her family. One day, she found a stranger in her living room after exiting the shower wearing only a towel. He responded that he believed no one was home when she asked him what he was doing in her apartment. The man stayed to assess the state of the shower and claimed not to have heard it run. Naturally, inspect your apartment to make sure nothing needs fixing. Jenna was astounded by the circumstance. She identified the man as Jeremiah Rosser, 29, and informed the building manager of the incident. The police carried out a small test. While the other person turned off the shower, one person stood at the front door. In the living room, and even close to the entrance door, one could clearly hear the sound of running water. It was highly unlikely that Rosser missed it and assumed nobody was home in such a scenario. The reason for Rosser's termination was discovered by the police after speaking with the building manager. He stopped showing up for work a few days after Jenna's murder. The detectives searched for the man because everything seemed very suspicious, but they ran into a problem. Rosser left his apartment and they were unable to find him anywhere else. He only has a former wife and two kids, according to what the police were able to learn. Consequently, there were three main suspects in this intricate case. Sean Spencer, Hood Stevens, and Jeremiah Rosser had to wait for the results from the lab where specialists were attempting to extract the DNA sample in order to ascertain which of them was the murderer. They were analyzing the blood on the young woman's shirt and rug, as well as the particles under her nails. They discovered that one of the blood drops on the rug contained genetic material that did not belong to Jenna as a result. The experts were finally able to use this sample, which matched the one taken from the particles under the young woman's nails. Two, the first step in extracting a complete DNA sample was to enter it into the FBI database, but there were no matches. This indicated that the murderer had never before been found guilty of a serious crime. Nevertheless, the obtained sample could now be compared to DNA samples from the three main suspects by the police. Their samples not being collected during the initial interrogations was the only issue. When the detectives attempted to get in touch with them, 
They were shocked to learn that all three had left the area and that their whereabouts were unknown. Investigators made the decision to use the killer's DNA sample rather than just standing by and waiting for the police to start looking for them. Men who lived in the same complex as Jenna and worked in a restaurant started voluntarily providing DNA samples. They were able to collect 50 DNA samples in total, but none of them matched the sample taken from the crime scene. Spencer was eventually located by the police, who discovered that he was staying with his parents three hours away from Brian. The youth gave an explanation of his couldn't deal with Jenna's passing and made the decision to spend time with his family in order to forget about the tragedy. His DNA sample, which he voluntarily provided, was immediately sent to the lab. The young man also gave permission for experts to check his body for scratches that were undoubtedly made by the murderer after all of his skin fragments were discovered beneath Jenna's nails. After that, the police were able to find Stephen's location. He also traveled 720 kilometers to see his parents, who live near Blinn College. He voluntarily provided a sample of his DNA, which was also sent to the lab. Finding the final suspect proved to be much more challenging, and it had to be done while the police awaited the laboratory's findings. When Rosser and his ex-wife were on the verge of divorcing, the police were able to get in touch with her, and she provided them with some unsettling information. Rosser was acting aggressively toward her. He extended his hand, knocked her to the ground, and attempted to choke her. He frequently caused scandals as well, which made it impossible to coexist with him. His union with his wife was annulled. Around the same time that Jenna was killed, all of this occurred. The police were able to find Rosser because of his ex-wife. Early October, seven months after the murder, saw this occur. He answered all of the detective's questions while behaving quite calmly during the interrogation. The man also denied involvement in the killing and voluntarily gave a DNA sample, never having been detained in his life. His car was also searched by the police, who made some intriguing finds. A few months prior to Jenna's murder, a laptop with a serial number that was listed in the theft report was discovered in the car. The worst part was that the police also discovered keys to several apartments in the residential complex where he worked, despite the fact that he was fired a week after Jenna's murder. Her neighbor had called the police after her laptop vanished from her apartment, but that wasn't the worst part. The manager was required to seize the keys because Rosser had no right to keep them. This all pointed to the fact that the man was petty theft, but could he advance to cold-blooded killing? In the meantime, all three DNA samples were examined by laboratory specialists. Rosser's DNA sample matched the sample discovered under the victim's nails, even though it later turned out that Jenna's boyfriend and her neighbor had nothing to do with the murder. The police detained Rosser right away after learning the results, but despite the DNA match, he insisted on his innocence. Naturally, this was of no assistance to him, and the man was accused of killing Jenna. Rosser was reluctant to give the details of that evening, so the investigators made up their own version of what took place. Rosser apparently broke into Jenna's apartment with the intent to use a key to her door to commit robbery. When the young lady had not yet arrived home from work in the evening before 9 p.m., this could have occurred. Rosser may not have had enough time to complete the intended crime because Jenna and her boyfriend arrived home, forcing the criminal to hide in the second bedroom and wait for Spencer to arrive. It's possible that Rosser opened the window in an effort to sneak out of the apartment without being seen, but that plan did not pan out. Rosser could finally try to leave the apartment through the front door after watching for Spencer to depart and hearing Jenna bid him goodnight on the phone. There are two explanations for what might have happened next. Either he attempted to leave the apartment, but Jenna saw him first, causing him to become panicked and attack her, or he went to her room on purpose with the intention of killing her. Even asserted that the young lady was the victim of his murder because she resembled his ex-wife. The man was prosecuted in court because he refused to accept responsibility for his actions. As is frequently the case in the state's legal system, the process for starting the trial dragged on for several months. But in December 2009, two weeks before the trial was scheduled to start, something unexpected occurred. 
Rosser finally acknowledged his guilt more than a year after his arrest. In an effort to have his sentence reduced, he and the prosecutor entered into a plea deal. Also, the man asked his parents and two children from his ex-wife were among the people excluded from the investigation from being involved in the legal process. This resulted in the trial being finished in record time. Despite the DNA sample match, the trial might have taken years to complete if he had not admitted guilt. Rosser was consequently given a 55-year prison term. He also received a five-year sentence for stealing a laptop. According to the assistant district attorney, this was the harshest punishment possible for a guilty defendant. Plea, however, if the investigation had been able to show that the murder was premeditated and planned, Rosser faced a much greater risk of being sentenced to death. Rosser might have been given this verdict. The man was sent to Texas's Rosheron prison, and his first chance at parole won't come until 2036. Rosser could be released early at the age of 55 because he was only 27 when the crime was committed. But if he completes his term, he won't be free until he is 82 years old. He exhibited a lack of eye contact with Jenna's family and friends throughout the trial. He was handcuffed and led into the courtroom wearing an orange prison jumpsuit. The man remained silent and unresponsive with his head bowed, only nodding to his parents when he saw them in the courtroom. The family of the deceased had the right to address the murderer in open court. They all three took advantage of this chance. Sister of Diana appeared in court 60, she said, standing a few centimeters from the offender. I hope Roster will realize the terrible act he had committed. She said she would pray for him and that one day she would be able to forgive the man who killed her sister. Rosa may not have regretted his actions, according to Jenna's mother. She forced the murderer to meet her eyes directly and declared firmly that he would never be able to fully comprehend the horror he had inflicted on their family. Jenna's father initially decided against testifying at the trial but later changed his mind. He made a last-minute commitment to visit any prison where the roster is posted and expose himself as a monster. Additionally, he stated his intention to show up at the hearing when roster applies for parole in 27 years. In addition, Jenna's parents sued the proprietor of the apartment building. When their daughter complained to Rosser's boss about his behavior, they were certain that her words were not taken seriously. Rosser's keys weren't seized after his firing either, which shows the manager was careless. If Jenna's complaints had been taken seriously and detention had been paid for Rosser's inappropriate behavior, Jenna's parents think their daughter would still be alive today. The only thing that is still a mystery is Rosser's precise motivations. He admitted to the murder but he remained silent about his motivations. Whatever the case, it is irrelevant now because his guilt is clear and he deserves to serve his entire life in prison. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like it. Thanks for watching. A woman was traveling home when she mysteriously vanished. Her friends started looking and the police eventually joined them. Everyone hoped she would be okay and go home soon. But within a few days, such horrific details about the case came to light that even seasoned detectives were taken aback. We'll explain what happened to Gemma McCluskey today and why this case shocked the entire nation of Britain. On February 5, 1983, McCluskey was born in England. She was raised in a big family. In her teenage years, the girl had two older brothers and devoted parents. Gemma, she made the decision to give acting a shot. And in 1997, she was given a few bit parts. She was offered a part in EastEnders, one of the most well-known British TV shows. In 2000, when she was just 17 years old, Gemma made an appearance in over 30 episodes in total. After that, her mother fell seriously ill, and someone had to take care of her forcing her to temporarily give up her acting career. After receiving a successful operation to remove a brain tumor, the woman unfortunately developed an infection during the procedure that was not curable. Gemma has since shared an apartment with her mother and Tony, her brother. Her brother looked after their mother while she was at work. She worked as a waitress in a number of bars and clubs. When Gemma was 29 years old in March 2012, she was taking care of her mother going to work, and occasionally hanging out with friends as usual. However, one day, 
Her friends noticed that they couldn't get in touch with her because she never picked up the phone, didn't reply to social media messages and didn't show up online. Her friends were numerous, and they they realized there was a problem right away and that Gemma hadn't been seen in a few days. Gemma had not been seen or heard from since their last meeting with her friend Erica on March 1st. Her brother visited the club where she was scheduled to work on March 3rd but the staff reported that Gemma had not arrived. Tony and his brother Danny made the decision to call the police at that point. They didn't believe that their sister had just left on them because they knew she would never abandon their ailing mother without giving them prior notice. After receiving a report of a missing person, our own investigators questioned Tony first because he lived with Gemma and may have been the last person to see her. Tony's testimony was crucial. There was a problem, though. Tony had been using marijuana regularly for many years, and his addiction was well known to the family. He couldn't even recall the exact day he last saw her. As a result of this habit, he was constantly having memory and concentration issues. After seeing Gemma, he also remembered seeing his sister on March 1st. He had smoked a lot of marijuana, as usual and nearly filled the apartment with water. Fortunately, Gemma was home and turned off the water after Tony decided to fill the bathtub and promptly forgot about it. She left the apartment after that to meet her friend Erica. Around 6 o'clock, according to Tony, is when he claimed to have left, and his sister remained unaccounted for. When Gemma and Erica talked about the bathtub incident, Gemma once more expressed her frustration with her brother's actions. He was a window washer by trade, but he despite being 35 years old, he spent almost all of his money on marijuana, and Gemma frequently felt like she had to constantly take care of him. After reporting the incident to the police the following day, Erica met Tony to go over the situation once more and attempt to come up with a theory as to where Tony's sister might have gone. The man, who was depressed, frequently broke down in tears and held himself responsible for what had occurred. He claimed that as a result of the bathtub incident, Gemma had once more lost faith in him. His addiction had already upset his family members before. Gemma's friends turned to the neighborhood paper in the meantime and asked to write about her disappearance. Journalists interviewed Gemma's brother and produced an article. Everyone hoped that news coverage would help identify any potential witnesses to the woman's appearance on March 5th. The cousins of Gemma made the choice to plan extensive searches. They attracted a large number of volunteers who combed the street and distributed flyers. In an effort to find leads, the sisters also actively shared information on social media. They did get their first lead on March 6th, but it wasn't what they were hoping for. In a call from an unknown number, Tony was instructed to bring two million pounds sterling to the Benefit Railway Station outside of London if he wanted to see his sister alive. Shortly after, the same unidentified caller made a second call and instructed him to bring 500 in Iraqi currency in addition to the money. On the third call that followed, the unidentified caller threatened to kill Gemma if they didn't get the money. Tony called his sister and asked to speak to her, but the caller informed him that she was locked in another room and that she frequently experienced violence. So he advised Tony to get the money out quickly. Danny, the other brother of the missing woman, was also called by the same person. Despite the fact that the number was concealed in each case, the police made an effort to track these calls. They were able to locate the caller, Sam Dunn, a 19-year-old Kent County resident, very quickly. His house was not far from the railroad. A judge issued a search warrant for Dunn's home after the caller's station where the money was ordered to be brought, and Dunn was taken into custody. The boy later admitted during questioning that he and his friends saw a post on social media about the woman's disappearance and decided to play a joke. So the police quickly came to the conclusion that the boy had nothing to do with Genesis' appearance. There were two numbers, Tony and Danny, but investigators soon found that this story also contained errors. The young man claimed the calls were he was merely seated next to him and had made something for him. The police were able to identify the caller as Sam and were unable to locate any additional parties. The court disapproved of the boy's joke as a result, and the boy was given a six-month prison term. Once more, the detectives lacked any leads. By reconstructing the events of that day, 
They were able to determine that Gemma left Erica's apartment around 1.17 p.m. and went home. She made several calls to Tony along the way and got home at 1.50 p.m. The CCTV footage proved this. Even though the police were almost certain that Gemma had been kidnapped by the time her phone was turned off after 18 minutes and had since been turned on, there was something odd about the timing of her movements. How could he have done that 18 minutes after the woman arrived home if, as is most likely the case, her kidnapper had turned off her phone? The most likely scenario was that Gemma was attacked inside her apartment, but Tony was present and their mother was in the hospital at the time. Investigators discovered a concerning conclusion. Could her brother be involved in her disappearance in some way? He smoked a lot of marijuana and people who have serious addictions are frequently capable of monstrous acts. After further investigation, detectives discovered that Gemma's sister and mother had reported Tony to the police on numerous occasions because he occasionally displayed aggressive behavior and even attacked Gemma. Questions were also raised about the brothers' actions during the investigation. While the friends of Danny and Gemma were actively searching, Tony sat at home and expressed his hopes for return of Gemma and wanted to be at home in case she did. He only joined the surge once the case started to receive attention from major TV networks. Police contacted him once more in an effort to elicit more detailed information about what transpired that day. Tony claimed that he last saw his sister between 1.30 a.m. and 3 p.m and that she left after that because her phone was turned off at 2.8 p.m. His account raised doubts. However, Tony was under the influence of marijuana almost constantly, so relying on his memory would not be prudent. Unbiased on March 6, five days after Gemma vanished, there was a very alarming development in the case. A suitcase struck a boatman as he was navigating a London canal at some point. It opened after the collision and the stunned boatman saw what was inside. Inside was a body of a person. Upon closer inspection, experts discovered that the torso was missing its head, legs, and arms. The lower back of the body belonged to a woman and bore a bow tattoo that matched Gemma's. Investigators immediately requested DNA testing to determine they used DNA from her toothbrush to fully match the body and identify it. Gemma McCluskey was the deceased. The woman's death and the horrifying information that her body was discovered in a suitcase shocked her family and friends. Nobody could understand how she could have experienced something so terrible. Everyone was waiting for the police to solve the murder case they were currently handling. They issued a resounding statement on March 7th. The very next day, researchers revealed that Tony McCluskey had been detained on a murder suspicion. He was unable to recall the events of that day, and his odd actions while looking for Gemma indicated that he was not at all interested in doing so and that he knew she had already passed away. Tony was the most likely suspect due to the circumstances surrounding her disappearance as well. Police believed that he may have snapped and killed his sister using large amounts of marijuana given that they had a fight that day over the overflowing bathtub and he was known to have an addiction. This over time can cause severe mental issues and a person is fully capable of committing impulsive crimes. Detectives grew more certain that Tony might be the murderer during the initial interrogation. He didn't dispute his guilt or that his sister was murdered. Instead, he simply replied, no comment. Investigators looked through his smartphone and discovered messages from his sister. He sent Gemma a message the day after she vanished with the words, I love you, and a few other sentiments. He wrote, Jim, call me when you get this message several hours later. What will we be eating tonight? Do you have work tonight? Detectives discovered a peculiar fact. Despite years of correspondence with his sister, he never once confessed his love for her. Instead, he wrote to his girlfriend the day after his sister vanished to apologize for not writing the previous evening. All of this did not indicate his guilt, but the police soon discovered much more compelling evidence. They discovered that on the day that Gemma vanished, Tony used a false name to order a taxi to a location close to the house. Tom discovered the route from the company's detectives after they reviewed footage from nearby security cameras. They could see Tony putting a sizable suitcase in the trunk of the car in the opening frames of the video that was recorded during the man's taxi ride. It was evidently very weighty, 
and the driver's testimony supported this assertion. He inquired about the contents of the suitcase after observing the man attempting to lift it. It was, according to Tony, a sizable music system. He requested to be taken to the canal side street where his sister's body would eventually be discovered. After questioning the neighborhood residents, the police identified one witness a student who was on her apartment's balcony when she noticed a man dragging a sizable suitcase toward the canal. When experts looked at the taxi truck, they discovered blood traces. It was identified as belonging to Gemma by DNA testing. Detectives were convinced Tony was transporting the same suitcase that contained his sister's body after gathering these clues, and on March 10th he was arrested, accused of murder. When the police searched their apartment, they discovered even more concerning evidence, a knife with barely perceptible blood traces, as well as blood stains in the bathroom that they had attempted to remove. All of this pointed to the woman being murdered in her own home. But one particular incident left the detectives with some unanswered questions. There should have been a lot more blood, as the woman's head arms, and legs had been severed from her body. The drainage pipes in the entire house were examined by experts, but they did not. They thought Tony may have laid something like plastic wrap or a tarp on the bathroom floor before gradually disposing of the blood with a lot of cleaning supplies after discovering noticeable blood traces there. Tony was observed purchasing trash bags the day after the murder on store security cameras. Investigators believed that he could use them to remove the body remaining components from the house. Soon after this version was verified, divers who kept searching the canal discovered bags with legs and arms there without DNA testing. The fact that they belonged to Gemma was already known to all, and later laboratory experts could only confirm this. Investigators changed their strategy because Tony resisted speaking to them despite having a substantial body of evidence against him. The police showed his father's surveillance footage that showed Tony loading the suitcase into the taxi's trunk on the day Gemma was killed. The father agreed to speak with his son in an effort to obtain a confession because he was certain that he was responsible for the murder. However, it only partially succeeded during Tony explained what had happened that day to his father during the conversation. He claimed that Gemma came home and ignited the argument over the overflowing bathtub by pleading with her brother to vacate her apartment. Gemma allegedly grabbed a knife when Tony made the decision to go to his room and Tony lost all memory of what happened after that. The story sounded like an attempt to shift responsibility for the murder so the investigators didn't believe it for a second and kept looking for more proof. Police discovered Gemma's head on March 9th and finally, experts were able to identify the cause of death because it occurred in the same canal. The injuries on the woman matched the kitchen knife discovered in her apartment and she had sustained several blows from a sharp object. Detectives have since been working to prepare the case for trial, and Tony has been detained. The victim's brother gradually started to admit his guilt throughout the nearly one-year trial. He wrote to his father frequently, but he insisted that he couldn't recall the murder's final moments. Acknowledged guilt for killing a sister, he claimed that he went into a virtual coma and lost control during the argument. Tony insisted that he never intended for his sister to pass away and that he is incapable of acting in such a way while being rational. The court case started in January 2013. The prosecution thought Tony became enraged when his sister asked him to leave the apartment during their argument. He simply wouldn't have had enough money to rent his own place given his propensity for marijuana. Perhaps this had an impact, significant part in what followed. The prosecution asserted that Tony fatally stabbed his sister after doing so. Based on the expert's findings, he took the body to the bathroom, laid down something akin to a tarp there, and used CCTV to dismember it there. Gemma's torso was placed in a suitcase and dumped into the canal by Tony. After that, he made several trips with garbage bags filled with additional body parts and other pieces of evidence, some of which he also threw into the water. His father was unable to bear to even listen. He left the courtroom to put an end to it all, and he didn't come back until they had finished talking about the specifics of his daughter's murder. Although Tony didn't remember it at all, 
he acknowledged that he most likely killed Gemma. He claimed that it might have been self-defense after his sister allegedly yelled at him while holding a knife. He did not know what happened next. His explanation was viewed as a blatant lie by the prosecution. An invited witness, a psychotherapist, stated that memory loss brought on by marijuana use is extremely rare and additionally, Tony had a clear plan to dispose of the body in order to conceal what he had done. Even though shock and amnesia should have subsided quickly, it took him many hours. In addition to dismembering her body and scattering the pieces throughout the canal, he also dialed a taxi under a false name and scrubbed the bathroom floor thoroughly afterward. All of this suggested that Tony was conscious of his actions and had a strategy to avoid punishment by destroying all evidence. Gemma's early years in court a friend also gave a testimony in which she disclosed that from a young age, her brother had been beating and humiliating her. Gemma occasionally had to cover up the signs of physical abuse with sunglasses. The witness claimed that Tony had no feelings for his sister and had always hated her. Only because it was convenient for him did he move in with her and their mother. He didn't even have to buy food or pay rent. Tony's lifestyle was ideal for him because he spent almost all of his income on marijuana. However, when his sister attempted to evict him, he lost it and murdered her. Tony was found guilty of murder by the jury after the trial's conclusion on January 30th. He was given a life sentence with the option of parole after 20 years. The victim's body was disposed of like a true maniac. The judge said in his closing remarks, and it appeared that Tony hoped it would never be discovered. There was no indication that the murderer felt regret for what he had done because he exhibited no emotion during the reading of the verdict or the trial itself. After Tony started serving his sentence, he was moved to a different prison because someone had set a price on his head. Another, it is unknown if this had anything to do with Gemma's murder or if he had argued with some other prisoners. After making an effort to stand by his son during the entire trial, Tony's father ultimately made the decision to stop communicating with him. The man claimed that he could not abandon Tony because he was his own son and he would lose two children at once. However, in the end, the man realized that Tony had no remorse for what he had done. Even then Tony did not seem to have any strong feelings. It seemed that his own family did not matter to him at all. Their mother passed away the same year that Tony didn't care about his own sister at all. The worst part is that none of this can be attributed to drug abuse. He had been abusing and humiliating Gemma since she was a young child, so there is no excuse for what he did. The realization of what kind of monster Tony is forces Tony's brother and father to live with that realization for the rest of their lives. Genuinely is. Feel free share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like it. Thanks for watching. An 18-year-old student visited her family for the holidays. But a few days later, she vanished without a trace. The police got involved after her mother started receiving strange messages. None of them were ready for the truth they learned during the investigation, which truly shocked the entire family. On August 9, 1996, a Norfolk, Virginia suburb welcomed Angelica Hadsell into the world. She soon gave birth to two younger sisters, but when her parents got divorced in 2005, the girls stayed with their mother. Angelica had three younger sisters, who she got along well with after her mother remarried in 2010. They had another daughter. In Farmville, Virginia, about three hours away, Longwood University accepted Angelica after she graduated from a nearby high school. In addition to joining two sports teams, she also had a year early graduation goal and had to work quickly to meet it. She continued to travel to Norfolk to see her sisters and parents on a regular basis, despite this. When Angelica was 18 years old, she visited her family in March 2015 with the intention of staying for a few days during her spring break. Angelica was delighted to be able to return to her family, was in a good mood, and enjoyed spending time with them. She got her three younger daughters ready for school the next morning, March 2nd, and then left to go to work, leaving Angelica at home by herself. But when her mother came home from work in the afternoon, Angelica was gone. The back door was open, music was playing, and only a few of her belongings were put into the washer, giving the impression that she had left quickly. This puzzled her mother because she and her daughter were always in contact, 
and she expected Angelica to let her know if she was going somewhere. However, on this particular day, Angelica didn't answer her phone, so her mother wrote to her and inquired as to where she had gone. When asked where she had gone on her walk with friends, Angelica replied that she had gone for one, but she didn't say specifically where. They then messaged back and forth about when Angelica planned to come home, and this time her mother noticed something odd once more. She claimed that the messages from her daughter were written in a very distinctive manner compared to how she was used to. Normally, Angelica would send her detailed messages with all the pertinent information, but this time she only got brief, ambiguous messages. Despite this, the young woman's mother did not have any unfavorable suspicions because she believed that the young woman simply wanted to hang out with her friends and that she was already 18 years old. Angelica didn't return home on that day, but she answered her messages anyway. She continued to evade questions about her location and her intended return time for the remainder of the day, though without providing any clear answers. Eventually, the daughter stopped responding to her mother. She then made the decision to contact Angelica's friends but was disappointed to learn that no one had seen her and had any idea of where she was. The mother contacted police detectives that evening on March 3rd after making the decision to do so. The young woman appeared to have left of her own free will at first. A note found in the house soon provided evidence in support of this version. It was probably written in Angelica's handwriting, according to Angelica's mother. One sentence is all there is. Angelica wrote that she needed some alone time with herself because of everything going on in a very strangely worded note. Her family could not comprehend what she was trying to say. She was a happy young lady who studied all her spare time and planned her future. She never made any significant life announcements, so the note seemed pointless. The fact that Angelica left her clothes, wallet, and car at home was also discovered by the police which already refuted the claim that she left on her own initiative. There was, however, nothing to suggest the opposite at the time. A piece of Angelica's credit card was discovered nearby by Cody, a neighbor who lived close to Angelica's family several days after the investigation began. He told the police about it, and that's when he was named as the prime suspect. He was questioned by detectives for 12 hours because they believed he might be connected to her disappearance. The police did not immediately drop their suspicions despite his denial of guilt. Additionally, according to Angelica's family members, by that point everyone in the neighborhood was aware of the case and many people were attempting to aid the investigation. Teams were formed to scour the area for any proof and everyone started to suspect Cody. After the credit card incident, it was discovered that he and Angelica went to the same university and dated for a while. Soon after, something else happened that seemed to link him to her disappearance. The situation changed quite strangely less than a week after the investigation started when Wesley Hadsall, Angelica's stepfather, stormed into Cody's home and discovered Angelica's jacket there. Wesley, who was helping her friends find his daughter while they were searching for her, instructed them to go to Cody's house and search there for Angelica's belongings because he thought the boy was responsible for her disappearance. The friends went to Cody's house and did exactly that. They discovered her jacket there and immediately informed the police. Again being questioned, Cody was under tremendous pressure. Despite this, Cody claimed he had no idea where the investigators were extremely perplexed. The detectives had a strong feeling that the boy was telling the truth during the interview Despite the fact that the jacket and Cody's home were both very important pieces of evidence, the most crucial thing he did was offer an alibi for the day of Angelica's disappearance in addition to voluntarily giving his DNA sample, taking a polygraph test, and agreeing to anything else they asked of him. He may actually be innocent, the police concluded after investigating this information. Wesley, Angelica's stepfather, gave them the tip they told Angelica's friends who had found the jacket. With this knowledge, the detectives acknowledged that the man might have planted the jacket. The key question was, why would he do that? Wesley's involvement in his daughter's disappearance was the most likely explanation. When the police started looking into his background, 
they discovered that he had been charged with and found guilty of more than 10 offenses, all of varying degrees of seriousness. He was frequently detained for robbery, drug use, and possession. In 2005, he abducted his own wife and brutally treated her for a number of days. In any case, the court was unable to establish his guilt, so he was spared any significant penalties. Throughout his life, he had spent a number of times and years in prison. The investigators also learned that Wesley's mother had expelled him from the home a few weeks prior to Angelica's disappearance because he had begun abusing strong, illegal substances. He'd been staying in hotels ever since. He was a serious suspect in light of everything that had happened. When asked when he last saw Angelica during the interrogation, the man insisted that he had nothing to do with her disappearance and that he was actively looking for her. Around noon on the day of her disappearance, Wesley claimed to have seen her at a gas station. The detectives looked over the video from the gas station cameras and couldn't find any evidence to back up the young woman's request for a few hundred dollars before they split up. Wesley's co-workers at work said he had taken a few hours off that day because his daughter had asked him for money. Around 2 p.m., he went back to work, nervous as ever. In his statement, there was a clear inconsistency. Wesley claimed to his co-workers that he had to leave because his daughter had requested money, but he admitted to the police that he had unintentionally seen Angelic at the gas station while driving by. There was no reason for Angelica to be at the gas station. Her car was parked close to her house. Wesley explained that the alarm had gone off at the home where he had been living prior to the argument with his wife when asked why he had left work that day. He also mentioned that he had received a notification on his phone. This information was not corroborated by the police, and it did not account for the blatant inconsistencies in his statement. In order to search Wesley's motel room, where he had been residing for the previous few weeks, the police next obtained a warrant. Interestingly, they discovered, because of his numerous convictions, Wesley had been maintaining a large number of guns and bullets. He was arrested right away because it was illegal for him to possess weapons. Wesley was accused of three crimes, illegal possession of a weapon, breaking into Cody's house and tampering with evidence because of the jacket he allegedly planted in his room, even though there was no evidence pertaining to Angelica there. He continued to maintain that he was doing everything in his power to locate his daughter, despite having no involvement in her disappearance. As a result, the court gave him a 20-year prison term and the detectives kept looking for the young lady. The most intriguing thing they found when they seized Wesley's work vehicle was the GPS navigator, which they sent for analysis to specialists. They also discovered shovel tape and dark gloves inside. According to the information they had on March 4th, the detectives were interested in learning where Wesley had gone in the days following Angelica's disappearance. Wesley left Norfolk and traveled 90 kilometers to a nearby town. He then returned to his job after parking his car somewhere for 20 minutes. On April 9th, the detective arrived at the scene and found his car parked in a remote area close to an abandoned house. They finally located Angelica's body in a nearby ditch after searching the area. Even though she was protected by a piece of plywood, it would have been extremely challenging to stumble upon her because the area around the house was overgrown and inaccessible. As a result, no one could have done so. An unexpected statement was waiting for everyone after the body was sent for a medical examination. Participants discovered a level of illegal substances in the young woman's blood that was three times the amount that would have been fatal for a typical person, according to the results of the process. The shocked members of Angelica's family. The young lady was involved in sports, almost exclusively studied, and didn't even drink alcohol. She was not taking any illegal drugs, which no one could believe. A second round of tests was chosen by medical professionals. It is possible to tell if someone has used narcotic drugs in the past by looking at their hair, and this analysis revealed that Angelica had never had any experience with illegal drugs. Because of this, it was virtually impossible to believe that she would suddenly decide to take a triple dose of medication. A piece of plywood was also placed over her body after it had been buried in the ditch. Everything pointed to the possibility that these drugs were administered to the young woman against her will 
with the intention of killing her while making it appear as though it was an accident. Wesley was interrogated by the detectives once more. When Angelica's body was discovered, the first thing they asked the man who was already in prison at the time was what his work car was doing nearby. The man's explanation, to put it mildly, was implausible. He claimed that he might have been set up and that he didn't go there on his own. He had additionally stated earlier that only he had access to this vehicle. Wesley even suggested that someone might have stolen his car's navigation system, driven to that residence, and then returned the device while the police gathered evidence. They were able to locate several recordings that demonstrated Wesley was in the city where his daughter's body was discovered on the same day, driving his work car from a number of street cameras situated along the route to this house. Even though everything pointed to the man being involved in the murder, the court still required additional proof, so the police worked on this case for several more years in an effort to gather indisputable evidence. Wesley was only charged with Angelica's murder at the end of the investigation because of this. According to the prosecution's account of events, the primary court hearing started in January 2022. Wesley went to the house on March 2nd, where Angelica was staying with the sole intent of robbing her and using her as a pawn in other violent crimes. He had planned to make it look like an accident, but instead, he took her out of the house, carried out his plan, and gave her a triple dose of drugs. The man had carefully thought out his plan, the police discovered repeatedly during countless interrogations, his denials and made every effort to discredit himself. The prosecution was successful in locating a witness who corroborated their story. This witness sold Wesley the same illegal substances that killed Angelica. Additionally, the court heard that the location information from Leslie's phone and Angelica's phone were compared after the police discovered Angelica's phone on the street. Her phone had been next to Wesley's since the young woman vanished, even when messages were sent from her mother's account. It was clear from this that Wesley had taken Angelica's phone and was attempting to reassure Angelica's mother that everything was fine, insisting that their client was innocent, the defendant's attorneys. They said Wesley had nothing to do with it, that the girl was depressed and had decided to take her own life. This account omitted any information regarding who buried her and covered her with a piece of plywood, or why his car was found close to the location where her body was discovered. All of these defenses attempted to account for either coincidences or attempts to frame Wesley. Interestingly, Despot having previously stated numerous times that he did not accept the overdose theory and thought Angelica was murdered, the man's opinion changed in court for an unknown reason, and the jury arrived at a decision in less than an hour. Wesley was convicted of murder and given a life sentence. The man stated that he would contest the judgment, and theoretically, he stands a good enough chance of succeeding in having the judgment reversed. As you might have guessed, there isn't a single physical piece of evidence against him. For instance, DNA evidence of his guilt would have been virtually unassailable if it had been discovered on the victim's body. Wesley's work vehicle was actually found close to the location where the young woman's body was later discovered, which is the main defense argument. The fact that this person abducted and violently treated his wife ten years prior to the incident raises doubts about any of his other arguments, though none of them are particularly strong proof. Does the defense have any stronger evidence, or does the prosecution's version seem to be more convincing? might very well succeed in getting a new hearing by contesting this decision. Your thoughts? Wesley is allegedly responsible for the murder, or is he unrelated? Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like it. Thanks for watching. A woman's body was discovered in her own house. When the police began their investigation, they discovered several worrying leads. The more they investigated the case, the stranger and more terrifying the information became. They eventually learned the truth after a number of years, but nobody anticipated this turn of events. On March 29, 1948, Karen Gregory was born in Albany, New York. She was the oldest of four children, and from a young age she assisted her parents in caring for her siblings. The girl loved nature and spent a lot of time in the outdoors. She also enjoyed sports. 
After graduating from high school, she wanted to work in the field of art. Karen enrolled at Rochester's Nazareth College, where she graduated with a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Science. She then spent some time teaching art in an elementary school before deciding to pursue a career as a graphic designer. She relocated to Florida in 1983 when she was 35 years old, where she met David McKee. He was a manager for a company that offered Vietnam War veterans consulting services, and he and Karen quickly grew close. The two were attracted to one another and dated for just over a year before David asked her to move in with him in Gulfport in the spring of 1984. Before this, Karen commuted frequently to David's home because she shared an apartment with a friend. On May 22nd, the woman accepted this offer and started gradually moving her belongings there. Karen finally packed up her apartment and left it empty after taking the last of her possessions. She admitted to being a little anxious to her neighbor. In order to speak at a conference, David had to travel to another state for work, and she would have to stay alone in his home for a full week. The woman left the apartment and went to her friend's home. There, they had a great time. Karen expressed to her friend how content she was with David and how happy she was to finally be moving in with him. After the friends finished talking around midnight, Karen went to David's house. He made several calls home the following day, but no one picked up. He called Karen's neighbor because he believed she might still be living in her old apartment. But the woman claimed she hadn't seen Karen in a while. David contacted Karen's sister and a few of her friends the following day, but none of them had seen her. All day long, he tried to get in touch with her, but he never heard back. In an effort to reach Karen before she left for work on May 24th, David called the house once more in the early morning hours. However, there was still no response. He called her boss later and learned that she hadn't arrived for work. David was now extremely worried and worried that something bad might have happened to Karen. Contacted the neighborhood hospitals and police departments to ask if they had seen anyone resembling Karen's description. He made the decision to call his neighbor Amy after learning that they had nodded. Amy looked out the window and answered in the affirmative as Karen's car parked in front of the residence. David's worry was only increased by this. He instructed Amy to visit the residence and rap on the door. He remained on the phone with her until she left to carry out his request because he was so anxious. There was no response when Amy knocked on the side door. She then circled the house and noticed that a window was open. Karen's name was repeatedly called out, but no one answered. When she pulled back the curtain and put her arm through the open window, she was astounded by what she discovered. She could see the hallway from the bedroom window where a woman's bloodied body was lying on the floor. Amy was hidden behind a wall and couldn't see the face, but she recognized the person as Karen, who, after she recovered from her shock, ran back to her own home where David was, keeping the call going. Before hanging up and dialing 911, she grabbed the phone and told him that something terrible had happened. Rapidly arriving medical personnel could only confirm Karen's demise. Due to the amount of blood throughout the house, even seasoned police officers were horrified as detectives started their investigation. Karen had fought her assailant all the way to the end. From the hallway to the front door, there were bloodstains. Several pieces of broken glass were scattered around. Investigators discovered that several hair strands matched. Karen's hair color was ingrained in the shattered glass. They hypothesized that she almost made it outside before her attacker cornered her in the restroom. A bloody footprint on the floor gave investigators their first indication of the crime. There were no bloodstains on Karen's feet, so the police concluded that Karen's killer was responsible for the footprint. The killer was in the bathroom, but it was not clear why he was barefoot. Police requested any information regarding a black Ford Ranger pickup truck they were searching for. They made it clear that no conclusions should be made just yet because the driver's involvement in the young woman's disappearance has not been established. Additionally, the sheriff made a 24-hour tip line announcement. A separate number had to be assigned. On the sixth day, when the number of calls had surpassed several hundred, police made an announcement that they were recruiting volunteers to search the area. People are divided into groups and assembly points are set up. The volunteer's task was to search the area for anything that might be relevant. And this time, Bangor and Old Town, two nearby towns, 
were included in the search area. The police called received more than 500 responses. About 400 people from the area were present, along with 100 professionals from different counties. There were horse-drawn and off-road vehicle search parties. The authorities tried to use every resource they could, given the size of the operation and the challenging terrain. They even used aerial photography in the hopes that the footage might reveal information useful to the investigation. The police made a depressing announcement the day after the search, precisely one week after Nicole went missing. The body of the young woman was discovered nearby Old Town in a wooded area not far from Road 43. They had no pressing need to release any information, stating only that a service dog found the body, which was covered in branches. The police soon disclosed that they were investigating a homicide, and the following day, May 20th, they reported the arrest of a suspect. It turned out to be Kyle Dewey, a 20-year-old local. At the time, no information was available, and the public was kept in the dark for a while. He was formally charged with premeditated murder the following day. It was later discovered that he was already in prison when he was arrested. Prison. For evading the police and a motorcycle accident last year, the man had received a 90-day prison sentence. Kyle had been on the outside until three days before Nicole's body was found, when he started serving his sentence. The young lady had known Kyle for several months, according to her friends. She complained to several friends that Kyle had tried to kiss her the day before she vanished and that Nicole had to put up a fierce struggle to stop him. It was well known that he had custody of his four-year-old daughter and resided with his parents. In a detion, Kyle was seeing Sarah, an 18-year-old girl, and he worked for a nearby provider of disability care. The judge agreed to his attorney's request for a preliminary hearing to take place behind closed doors. The judge's decision was criticized as a result of the public and media not having access to information about the case. Several hundred locals gathered before Nicole's funeral on May 26th to pay tribute to her memory by launching. A judge eventually lifted the public disclosure ban on the case a few days after the funeral as a result of public pressure, and some disturbing details were revealed. Police first discovered that Kyle's computer was used to register the fake Facebook account, and that his IP address was used for all subsequent sessions. As a result, Kyle was responsible for tricking her out of the house just before the murder and the medical examiner's report made it abundantly clear that the young woman had passed away on the day of the murder. Kyle's brother and his girlfriend, whom the suspect was dating according to Sarah, whom the suspect was dating, Kyle confessed to her about the murder a few days after it occurred, were two of the police's key witnesses at the time of Sarah's disappearance. This took place right away after Sarah was summoned for questioning. She realized that although there was no proof, the police had suspicions about Kyle. He was questioned as well, but he responded that the day the young woman vanished, he was at work. Kyle informed his brother that Nicole was drawn to the the man intended to make it appear, as though Brian Butterfield had abducted her and was holding her captive in a remote location using a false Facebook account. The young woman, Kyle thought, would fall in love with her savior if he could find her and free her. To put it mildly, it all sounds odd, but there is more to come. Just keep in mind that this is the perpetrator's brother reported account. The subsequent sequence of events went as follows. Kyle enticed Nicole to a remote area along Hudson Road. When Nicole arrived at the designated location, he was already there waiting for her, hiding in the bushes, his face covered by a ski hat. Her head was taped after he pounced on her loaded her into his father's black Ford Ranger pickup truck and drove off. He said the car was parked close by. Kyle took her away from the scene of the kidnapping. The young woman showed no signs of life as he started to pull her out of the vehicle. When he realized that the duct tape was preventing her from breathing, she died. In a panic, he made the decision to keep his girlfriend from finding the body. Kyle repeated the tale while supplying more information. He claimed that on the way back to his house, he stripped Nicole of nearly all of her clothing and threw her out the window before hiding the body. This was done to ensure that his DNA would not be discovered by the police. The young woman's belongings, including several pieces of clothing, were discovered by the police. Almost exactly where Kyle had attacked Nicole was where they were. 
The crucial detail in this situation was that Kyle told his girlfriend almost exactly where he had struck her. The reason the police were able to find Nicole's body in the body was because Sarah went to them and gave them the whole story. Despite Kyle's refusal to accept responsibility, the situation was not in Kyle's favor when the police learned the full scope of the medical examination and more damning evidence arose against the suspect. Kyle's DNA sample was precisely matched by blood that was discovered under Nicole's fingernails. A few days after the murder, the boy was interrogated and there were deep scratches on his face, attributed to a workplace injury he had. The injuries to the young woman's neck also provided further proof that strangulation was the cause of her death. This contradicted Kyle's claims that if he had taped the victim's mouth, there wouldn't have been any such injuries, as he told his brother and the young woman. The trial dragged on because his attorney asked for a psychological assessment, but an intriguing thing occurred a few months after his arrest. After a stolen gun was discovered in Kyle's house, he was charged with theft. The man had previously been detained for robbery on several occasions, but each time he was released after paying a fine, a trial was scheduled for February 2015 after an examination revealed Kyle to be entirely sane. The defendant was in custody prior to the start of the trial while awaiting trial. The correctional officer where Kyle reported to serve a sentence for eluding police and a motorcycle accident was one of the witnesses whose testimony Kyle's attorney sought to have removed from the case file. Kyle was there to serve a sentence. The officer claimed that the man was acting extremely anxious and even crying when questioned the cause of his anxiety. It's not about the time limit. It's about what else I've done, Kyle allegedly said. The case started on February 22, 2015. According to Kyle's attorney, his client is not guilty of the murder and the investigation was totally biased. He was at home, the defense claims, and Nicole was attacked by someone else while he was away. Sarah, Kyle's girlfriend, was mentioned as a potential suspect. Nicole was allegedly hated by Sarah because of Nicole's relationship with Kyle. The attorney asserted that she had access to Kyle's computer and used it to set up a phony account on which to blame her boyfriend for the murder. This theory was unsupported by any evidence and was in conflict with the facts. Kyle used both his computer and his phone to access the fake account. Additionally, he changed his personal account to a fake one by logging in via one app. As a result, it was obvious when he logged out of one account and into another right away. Sarah was also not supported by any physical evidence, unlike Kyle, whose DNA was found on the victim's clothes, which the murderer threw away on his way home, as well as under her fingernails. The following witness was the actual Brian Butterfield, who claimed that Kyle had been angry with him for a long time because Brian had dated his ex-girlfriend. He believed that this was what prompted Kyle to set up a phony account in his name so that he could later use it to frame the young man. The prosecution also provided correspondence screenshots demonstrating that Kyle was speaking with both Nicole and other young women underage. The next witness was Kyle's coworker, who we worked with at a disability care business. The defense attorney for the defendant insisted that Kyle's face scratches developed while he was at work but the witness refuted this. In accordance with his account, he and Kyle were at the residence of a woman who was afflicted with mental illness on May 11th and 12. She attacked Kyle at one point when she became irate, leaving several scratches near his eye on his face. Kyle sought assistance at the hospital, but was informed the following day, May 13th. On his face, a coworker notices fresh scars. This took place immediately after Nicole vanished. Another co-worker claimed that Kyle left the office at around 9 p.m. on the day Nicole vanished and, despite being on duty all night, did not return until 6 in the morning. He also requested that no one be informed of his absence at the same time. Four prisoners who Kyle had interacted with while detained pending trial were also called before the court. They all claimed that Kyle had told them he had killed the woman. He strangled her while giving the impression to others that it was an accident. He acknowledged that he had initially intended to carry out the crime. The testimony of an inmate named Scott Ford, who had spent the majority of his life behind bars and had a reputation for being knowledgeable about the legal system, was even more fascinating. Kyle decided to ask about the best way for him to get away with his crime after being in touch with him for a while. 
Then Kyle penned several versions of what had transpired in the coal on paper and handed the all of these accounts shared one thing in common. Kyle acknowledged that he had set up a false account and tricked Nicole into going to a deserted area, but he went on to give various accounts of what had happened. He initially claimed that his initial plan had been to simply kidnap her before rescuing her. However, he refused to accept duct tape, and the young woman died as a result. Nicole reportedly fainted from fear after being startled out of the bushes, according to him. Kyle drove while taping her mouth shut. He took her out of town and found she had no pulse. Another explanation was that he neglected to use the duct tape, and the girl died in vain. According to a different account, the cow jumped out of the bushes and grabbed her torso before realizing that he had actually squeezed her throat, which caused her to pass out. As we can see, each of these tales appeared to be completely illogical, but they all contain information that will be extremely helpful for the investigation. Kyle went into great detail about where and how he attacked her and where he hid. He not only described the body but also the precise spot where while wearing a ski mask, he had attacked the young woman. Only the murderer would have known these details since they were all kept a secret until the trial started. When the sheets were examined by experts, they discovered Kyle's DNA and fingerprints. The trial had its share of challenges. Kyle's younger brother, who had testified against him in court two years earlier, started to dispute the assertion that he had admitted to the killing. The difficulty lay in the brother had meticulously documented everything that had occurred, information that he could only have obtained from Kyle. Kyle was the only person who remained silent throughout the entire trial. Even when testifying for himself, he refused. He was given the opportunity to accept a deal from the investigation in which he would receive a lighter sentence for confessing, but he turned it down. The final court hearing where the decision was made took place on March 6, 2016. Kyle was found responsible for Nicole's deliberate murder. His family members and lawyer attempted because of his age and the fact that he had a young daughter, but the judge would not impose a lighter sentence. For both the murder and the kidnapping, Kylie was sentenced to 60 years in prison. The judge stated during the closing arguments that Kyle's guilt in the case was obvious and that the evidence against him was overwhelming. He fabricated several different accounts of what occurred and made every effort to get out of jail rather than expressing regret and confessing. The court declined to commute his sentence because of this. The judge was also inclined to think that Kyle had. He had been working on a plan for weeks, a plan to kill Nicole. The goal's parents praised the sentence as just and expressed their desire for him to never be released from prison again. They also spoke about the risks of social media, using the murder of their daughter as an example, in a number of interviews and appearances on different television programs. They believed that if the perpetrator had not been given the chance to impersonate someone else online, the tragedy might have been prevented. However, Kyle has supporters. Even without fake accounts, we could eventually reach the point of murder. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like it. Thanks for watching. A woman's body was discovered in her own house. When the police began their investigation, they discovered several worrying leads. The more they investigated the case, the stranger and more terrifying the information became. They eventually learned the truth after a number of years, but nobody anticipated this turn of events. On March 29, 1948, Karen Gregory was born in Albany, New York. She was the oldest of four children and from a young age she assisted her parents in caring for her siblings. The girl loved nature and spent a lot of time in the outdoors. She also enjoyed sports. After graduating from high school, she wanted to work in the field of art. Karen enrolled at Rochester's Nazareth College, where she graduated with a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Science. She then spent some time teaching art in an elementary school, before deciding to pursue a career as a graphic designer. She relocated to Florida in 1983 when she was 35 years old, where she met David McKee. He was a manager for a company that offered Vietnam War veterans consulting services, and he and Karen quickly grew close. 
The two were attracted to one another and dated for just over a year before David asked her to move in with him in Gulfport in the spring of 1984. Before this, Karen commuted frequently to David's home because she shared an apartment with a friend. On May 22nd, the woman accepted this offer and started gradually moving her belongings there. Karen finally packed up her apartment and left it empty after taking the last of her possessions. She admitted to being a little anxious to her neighbor. In order to speak at a conference, David had to travel to another state for work, and she would have to stay alone in his home for a full week. The woman left the apartment and went to her friend's home. There, they had a great time. Karen expressed to her friend how content she was with David and how happy she was to finally be moving in with him. After the friends finished talking around midnight, Karen went to David's house. He made several calls home the following day, but no one picked up. He called Karen's neighbor because he believed she might still be living in her old apartment. But the woman claimed she hadn't seen Karen in a while. David contacted Karen's sister and a few of her friends the following day, but none of them had seen her. All day long, he tried to get in touch with her, but he never heard back. In an effort to reach Karen before she left for work on May 24th, David called the house once more in the early morning hours. However, there was still no response. He called her boss later and learned that she hadn't arrived for work. David was now extremely worried and worried that something bad might have happened to Karen. Contacted the neighborhood hospitals and police departments to ask if they had seen anyone resembling Karen's description. He made the decision to call his neighbor Amy after learning that they had nodded. Amy looked out the window and answered in the affirmative as Karen's car parked in front of the residence. David's worry was only increased by this. He instructed Amy to visit the residence and rap on the door. He remained on the phone with her until she left to carry out his request because he was so anxious. There was no response when Amy knocked on the side door. She then circled the house and noticed that a window was open. Karen's name was repeatedly called out, but no one answered. When she pulled back the curtain and put her arm through the open window, she was astounded by what she discovered. She could see the hallway from the bedroom window where a woman's bloodied body was lying on the floor. Amy was hidden behind a wall and couldn't see the face, but she recognized the person as Karen, who, after she recovered from her shock, ran back to her own home where David was, keeping the call going. Before hanging up and dialing 911, she grabbed the phone and told him that something terrible had happened. Rapidly arriving medical personnel could only confirm Karen's demise. Due to the amount of blood throughout the house, even seasoned police officers were horrified as detectives started their investigation. Karen had fought her assailant all the way to the end. From the hallway to the front door, there were bloodstains. Several pieces of broken glass were scattered around. Investigators discovered that several hair strands matched. Karen's hair color was ingrained in the shattered glass. They hypothesized that she almost made it outside before her attacker cornered her in the restroom. A bloody footprint on the floor gave investigators their first indication of the crime. There were no bloodstains on Karen's feet, so the police concluded that Karen's killer was responsible for the footprint. The killer was in the bathroom, but it was not clear why he was barefoot. After examining the victim's body, medical professionals determined that she had sustained about 20 stab wounds and had been subjected to violence. Experts also removed biological material from the murderer. Sadly, DNA testing was not available in 1984, so this clue was ineffective in identifying the murderer. Several bloody fingerprints were also discovered on her body, but they couldn't be used because they were too smudged. Experts estimate that the woman was attacked the same night she returned home from her friend's house because she was killed, about 30 hours before she was found. Another element caught the eye of the viewer right away. As soon as the police and medical personnel arrived, they noticed Karen's body was covered in a lace corset over a shirt. Evidently, the offender did this. After investigating the scene thoroughly and gathering all relevant information, the police gave Karen's friends permission to begin clearing up. The women didn't want David to arrive and witness all this horror. All of the victim's friends and acquaintances knew how much he loved her and wanted to at least somewhat lessen his suffering. David had to travel across the country to his conference because it took a long time to get home. 
and in the meantime, the detectives started questioning the neighbors. The crime rate was incredibly low, and the neighborhood was regarded as being quite prestigious and secure. They even had a neighborhood watch and many residents who knew one another. When neighbors keep an eye on the peace and notify the police of any suspicious activity, they are in agreement. The neighborhood watch did not carry out its duties in this instance, though. Detectives learned that 16 locals were attacked on May 23rd at 1.15 a.m. None of them called the police after hearing a piercing female scream because they all claimed that the scream quickly stopped and they did not get the impression that anyone might be in danger. Even the neighborhood watch leader, who practically lived across from the victim, did not think it was necessary to call the police. He heard a muffled scream while working on his motorcycle in the garage and listening to the radio. The man left the garage and walked down the street without seeing anything odd before coming back. On the morning of May 23rd, a neighbor who lived across from David made an intriguing observation. She noticed that his front door was open, and that night she also heard a scream, but she didn't connect the two. One specific element of her account stood out. The door was lit when the police responded to the call. Given that the body had been in the residence for about 30 hours, the perpetrator might have tried to hide his tracks by returning and shutting the door. Notably, none of the notable properties displayed any indications of forced entry. Doors. Despite the fact that there were no indications of forced entry, detectives theorized that the perpetrator might have entered through the back window. Karen either knew the killer and let him in herself, or she left it open the entire night. Another intriguing observation was provided to the detectives by the neighborhood watch chief. An unidentified man pulled up to Karen's home in the evening of the day following her murder. He exited the vehicle, rapped on the door a few times, and continued to scan the area. He then went back to the vehicle, but some. He returned a short while later, holding a piece of paper in his hand, placed it on Karen's windshield and then started his car. As soon as they arrived, the police checked the vehicle and discovered a note that read, Karen and David, hi, I stopped by around 7.15 p.m. but didn't see any signs of life. I have what you requested, but I doubt I'll be back because I have a lot to do tonight. Given that Karen had already been dead for almost a minute when this person arrived, the detectives immediately noticed the warning that there were no signs of life. Such a choice of words throughout the day was very unsettling. Investigators searched for Peter, who was mentioned at the end of the note. He had actually been right there all along, it turned out. The man visited their home soon after learning about the body's discovery from Karen's former neighbor. The man actively participated and responded to all inquiries. He voluntarily gave them his fingerprints and revealed what, in Peter's account a few days earlier, he was doing close to the victim's home. Despite the fact that David was already scheduled to leave for a week-long business trip, Karen allegedly informed him that David would also be attending the dinner when she called and invited both of them. Peter was also questioned by the detectives about what he meant in the note when he said, I have what you asked for. The man claimed that he had borrowed a cassette from them and intended to give it back. Another oddity was that Peter allegedly failed to notice the numerous broken windows or the almost completely covered path to the front door. Windows. The man insisted that during their conversation, he hadn't noticed anything or paid any attention to it. An extensive cut on Peter's hand was spotted by one of the detectives. The man covered the scratch when the policeman examined his hand and remarked that he always gets scratches after playing with dogs or fixing his car. The detectives decided to check his alibi because all of the aforementioned seemed very suspicious. Peter claimed that he was sleeping at home the night of the murder and his neighbor told the police that this was true. Didn't rush to rule him out of the running because an alibi like that could easily be a fabrication. However, the detectives quickly identified another suspect, David Karen's boyfriend. He claimed that night that he was sleeping in his hotel room and was in Rhode Island, which is 2,000 kilometers from his home. However, the police discovered a very intriguing clue at the crime scene in a local Rhode Island newspaper published on May 23rd the day Karen was killed. The detectives began to wonder if it was real because it was so strange. 
before his upcoming conference appearance, David could have taken a flight to Florida, murdered his girlfriend, and then come home. They estimated travel and flight times from airports and came to the conclusion that it was feasible. Since David allegedly slept alone in his hotel room that night, no one was able to verify his alibi. The neighborhood watch chief added his observations as well. When the woman visited his home, he had repeatedly observed arguments between Karen and David. David, on the other hand, was adamant that their relationship was wonderful and rarely did the couple have arguments. When questioned about the newspaper, David replied that he had purchased it on May 21st from a shop close to his house. To have the week's weather forecast with him, he was going to bring it on the trip. When investigators visited that shop, the clerk said they did indeed sell that newspaper. He even recalled David having purchased it on January 21st. The clerk said the paper actually released that issue a few days ago, as is customary for printed newspapers. As a result, doubts about David vanished from the the man noticed the absence of a white lace corset that Karen had purchased for herself a few months earlier, one that was strikingly similar to the one worn by Karen's killer. When they asked him if anything was missing from her home in the background, the detectives assumed right away that the despicable criminal had taken it as a trophy as a result of this. A finely detailed drawing of a watch bearing the name Steven Fischler's signature was discovered in the victim's home, and the police chose it to follow this lead. The detectives were contacted by a specific detail. Attention blued seemed to be on the paper. The detectives asked Karen's co-workers after quickly learning that Stephen and Karen were employed by the same business. They discovered a lot of fascinating data. Nearly all of the staff members described Stephen as being rather strange. He made a concerted effort to win over all of his female co-workers. He showed them images that were pornographic. He even attempted to persuade his colleagues to read a pornographic poem he had written. Every single woman who worked with him acknowledged that he frightened them. Karen also expressed her displeasure with his conduct on numerous occasions, but management paid little attention. He denied giving Karen that drawing when the detective spoke with him. In order to prove his innocence, he also said he barely knew the victim and offered to submit to a polygraph test. The most intriguing part started when the investigators swiftly set up such a test. Everything seemed to be going smoothly at first, but after one of the questions, Stephen abruptly admitted that he had killed Karen. He immediately changed his mind after a brief period of time and asserted that he was unrelated to it. Strangely, the polygraph operator failed to find a lie in either situation. The detectives were perplexed by this, but were unable to rely on the polygraph results. This tool is far from ideal and simply cannot tell whether someone is telling the truth or not. They also realized that Stephen was obviously a very strange person who could say anything at that moment. Soon after, experts examined his drawing and came to the conclusion that ketchup, not blood, caused the red stain. They started to wonder if Stephen had anything to do with Karen slaying. Despite having so many potential suspects, the police were unable to compile sufficient evidence to convict anyone, and the case went unsolved for a number of months. Detectives kept looking for new leads but were unsuccessful. This persisted until December when an intriguing event took place. Residents of Gulfport organized special events to celebrate the retirement of a well-respected local. There were numerous attendees, including Mary, who struck. The murder of Karen Gregory was brought up during their conversation with an additional police officer, and Mary unintentionally mentioned that she too had heard Karen Gregory's piercing scream that night. The officer noticed a peculiar detail right away. Mary lived two blocks away from Karen's home, and at first the police didn't even question the occupants of such far-off homes. The scream must have been extremely loud because the woman could hear it. However, the neighborhood watch chief, who practically lived Karen's neighbor across the street, described it as muffled. But the man clearly could not consider it quiet if the neighbors two blocks away heard it, especially given that he was at the time in his garage with the door open. Despite the suspicions raised by all of this, the police took their time in questioning the head of the neighborhood watch. He was George Lewis, a 22-year-old. He was a firefighter by trade and was close with almost every police officer at the neighborhood police station. 
All the neighbors spoke highly of him and said that he lived with his wife and young child. However, the detectives were unable to disregard Mary's account. When George had some free time, they asked him to call and come to the station. The man concurred but never appeared. Before this, it should be noted, he frequently dropped by the station just to visit with his friends. It was difficult for the case's lead detective to consider George as a murderer because he was even present at his wedding. In just one month in January 1985, they were able to communicate with him. This cream, according to George, didn't seem to be very loud. If he remembered anything else from that evening, he thought that this might be his fault, but George told him the same thing, with the exception of the brief period when his testimony was being taken for the first time. He claimed that after hearing the scream, he exited the garage and started to walk down the street, but this time he said that he had only gone up to the road to take a look before coming back. This discrepancy in the testimonies did not seem significant given the length of time that had passed since then. Nevertheless, the police wanted to make sure he was telling the truth, so they offered to have him take a polygraph test. To their surprise, George agreed but did not share it with anyone. The man later confessed to concealing one fact from the detectives during a conversation with them. He asserted that he saw an unidentified man close to Karen's home the night she vanished. The only thing George could recall about the man was that he was tall, had red hair and a beard. Once again, the detectives questioned whether he was telling the truth. George was at a loss as to why he hadn't mentioned this man during the initial interview, but he was afraid that the man might harm his family because he knew where he lived. Despite this, the police made an effort to pursue this tip and identify the man, but they were unsuccessful. In addition, it was completely dark outside and there were almost 30 meters between George and Karen's homes. George insisted on his account, so the police reenacted the events of that day despite the detectives' claims that the man could see the color of another person's hair in such circumstances. At night, he approached George and asked him to describe the man standing 30 meters away. Since he was blind, the detectives were even more skeptical of what he was saying. Nevertheless, they strolled the neighborhood and questioned the populace. Have you seen a suspicious man with red hair who might wander the streets at night? Several women admitted to their surprise that they had occasionally seen a man looking into their windows while it was dark. None of them were able to make out the man's face, but one woman did, and he resembled George Lewis a lot, in her opinion. She wasn't completely sure because it was pitch black outside, and the man bolted for the door. Although George acknowledged that he occasionally peered into his neighbor's windows, he insisted that he did so only to ensure their safety. As the leader of the neighborhood watch, he claimed he was only checking to see if everything was all right with them because he was responsible for the neighborhood's security. However, all of this did was fuel suspicions against him. George consented to an in March 1985. He changed his story once more during the second polygraph examination. He acknowledged that he saw the man in front of Karen's house, that he spoke to him, and that the man threatened to kill him if he revealed who he was to anyone. Once more, the polygraph examiner picked up on a lie, so the investigator directly questioned George, did he kill Karen Gregory? The man responded negatively, and his assertions were again regarded as false. The detectives then decided to speak with George's wife, who informed them that she had awakened that night from piercing cry and was extremely terrified. Her husband was nowhere to be found when she searched the house and went to the garage, where the light was also off. After that, the woman went back home and waited in the kitchen for her husband, who didn't show up for another 30 minutes. The detectives also made the decision to investigate George's past. They spoke with his ex-wife, who revealed that while George appeared to be kind, caring and responsible, in actuality he was extremely aggressive and frequently raised his hand to her during arguments. He even choked, she continued. Afterward, the investigators occasionally spoke with George's close friends, who also provided some intriguing details about the months prior to the murder, when Karen wasn't yet living with him, but still paid him visits on occasion. The detectives discovered that George occasionally engaged in orgies and mentioned that he wanted Karen to join them. He also discovered that he told his friends that he liked her. 
The police also discovered that George had a secret in the summer of 1984, during these conversations with his friends. He had an affair with a young lady who lived a few houses away. They talked to her and discovered additional information. The girl acknowledged that George gave her a white lace corset for her 17th birthday. The man made her wear it, even though it was too big for her. When Karen's boyfriend saw the corset, the police asked her to give it to them. He claimed that a corset that was exactly like Karen's had vanished from the home and that its measurements were accurate. The first concrete evidence against George came from this, but the after taking a footprint from him and sending it to FBI specialists for comparison with the footprint discovered on Karen's home's bathroom floor, the detectives dug even deeper. The results eventually returned with a perfect match. When George was summoned back to the police station in March 1986, the detectives repeatedly questioned him about whether he had been at Karen's home on the night of the murder. Up until the detective informed him of the examination's findings, the man maintained his denial. George kept denying everything for the next few minutes, but then he changed his story and told the police that he saw a red-haired man near Karen's house, ran inside, and discovered that everything was covered in blood and that Karen was lying in the hallway with a cut to her throat. He then declared that he would never again remember that horrifying experience. Of course, the detectives didn't believe his story for a second because it was so absurd, but George was correct about one thing. The victim's throat did have a cut on it that hadn't been there before. Even if his story was true, he wouldn't have been able to see the cut because there was so much blood on Karen's body if it had been made public. At least skilled medical professionals couldn't see it until the blood had been removed. This meant that unless George was the murderer, he could not have known about the cut. It took everything mentioned above for authorities to apprehend the man. His detention occurred on March 15th. He might have received the death penalty for what he did almost two years after the Florida murder. Although they did not share the police's conviction that George was the murderer, George's close friends and his co-workers in the fire department still thought highly of him and made every effort to assist him. These people mortgaged their homes and even donated a portion of their pay to George's wife and child, in addition to raising $300,000 for bail on his behalf. George was consequently freed in late December. He continued to reside in his home for an additional six months while the trial went on until June 4, 1987. George's attorneys insisted that the man hadn't killed anyone and hadn't altered his account of what happened when speaking with the police. However, when the suspect was given the opportunity to speak, he concocted an entirely different tale. The same thing happened at the beginning. He spotted a man close to Karen's house, ran inside, and discovered her body. George was extremely ill after visiting this website, so he ran to the bathroom and puked. This appears to be how he attempted to explain the, there was a clear distinction here. If he had entered Karen's house barefoot at first, the bloody traces would have extended from where he discovered her body to the bathroom, but they weren't there when asked why he didn't call the police. George claimed that at the time he was only 22 years old and that he was too terrified to tell anyone. It's important to note that the man had worked as a firefighter since he was 18 and frequently encountered horrific circumstances. But when he, he found his neighbor dead and for some reason, he was unable to even call the police. George had feelings for Karen for several months, the prosecution insisted. He waited until her boyfriend went away for a week before deciding to exploit the circumstance. She was assaulted by George after he broke into her home but she was able to scream and even fight back. He eventually killed her and violently treated her. His wife thinks there might be an easy explanation for the footprint he left on the bathroom floor. Only 30 minutes had passed since the scream when he arrived home. It appears that he tried to wash the blood-stained clothes in the bathroom and removed the blood-stained socks from his shoes. The jury ultimately found him guilty after the two-week trial. When his sentence was about to be announced a month later, the judge abruptly set the date for a new trial. It was successfully pushed through by George's attorneys. They insisted that the police had tampered with some of the evidence and that the prosecution had not been able to fully investigate. All parties involved in the process were taken aback by the judge's decision 
because it is unusual and required them to show their client's guilt. The prosecutor was able to appeal this choice, and it was overturned in 1989. George ultimately received a life sentence. The man had no prior criminal history, so the death penalty was ruled out. Since then, George has made several attempts to appeal his sentence but has been rejected each time. Many of his friends and family members still thought he was, despite all the information and proof against him, he is innocent. 52-year-old George passed away while incarcerated in 2014. He remained adamantly innocent up until the very end, even speaking in an interview about how difficult it was to endure the punishment for a crime he did not commit. It's important to note one thing. However, none of the 16 neighbors who heard Karen scream dared to call the police. The patrol could have quickly arrived at the scene because the police station was close by their street. The detectives working on this case quickly acknowledged that Karen's life might have been saved in this situation, but it was not. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like it. Thanks for watching. In the state of Nuevo León, specifically in Mexico, an 18-year-old young woman named Dabani Escobar did not return home after going to a party on the evening of April 8, 2022. What happened to her has become the most discussed news in Mexico, and debates about what actually happened continue to this day. Devani Escobar, the only child of Dolores and Mario. Escobar was a student of law and criminology. Friday, April 8, 2022, at around 8 odd p.m., she went to the party with two friends, but she didn't return home. The next day, a big number of police officers and volunteers joined the hunt for her. On April 11th, Devani's parents, who were desperately trying to locate her, shared a picture on her social media site, which revealed the first anomalies and specifics of her absence. The image, which was taken from the side by an unidentified person, shows the body standing in the center of a motorway. It's unknown if she was aware that she was being photographed at the time. When his daughter did not come home on April 9th, her father received this image and put a caption saying that, this was the final time anyone saw his daughter, according to Mario. Additionally, he noted that Damani's group companions safely made it back to their homes. They allegedly placed Damani in a cab and requested that the driver take her home. This picture was taken at the time by a taxi driver. It wasn't immediately obvious how or why this photo was shot, but in Mexico, where femicide is a widespread issue and statistics show that 10 women disappear on average every day, it went viral and sparked a massive outrage protests found new traction in the state of Nuevo León alone, where 52 women went missing in the first quarter of 2022. On April 13th, hundreds of worried citizens marched through the streets of Monterrey, carrying banners with pictures of the missing ladies, while the detectives working on the case started to piece together what had happened before Devani's disappearance. Their case was supported by the young women's friends' statements and video evidence from security cameras. In light of the fact that Bonnie only met the second young woman on the day of her disappearance, it is important to note that calling the two young women Bonnie attended the party with friends is a stretch. The police discovered video from a business located about four miles away. The tape taken at 11.30 as p.m. shows the young woman standing next to the cashier, five kilometers from the residence of the deceased. They also bought plastic glasses, Coke, and a 750 milliliter bottle of vodka. The party waited near the store for almost an hour, during which time they used some of the things they had bought. They departed the business at 12.49 a.m. and took a taxi to Nuevo Castillo Bar, which was about eight kilometers away. When they got there, they discovered the event they were going to had. They were advised that another party was nearby, albeit it had already concluded, so they chose to head there at 1.30 a.m. Even though they were unknown at the private property party, the young women begged permission to enter. Two hours and 15 minutes after they were given permission to enter, the body can be seen attempting to flee from a man on surveillance footage provided by the police, but he catches up with her and stops her. When other people arrive, Bonnie tries to kick the man again but misses. The argument appears to have been settled. 
When partygoers were questioned by the police, they said that the argument started because the body was very inebriated. She had earlier purchased a bottle of vodka, which some people tried to seize, but she wouldn't give it up and insulted them. It's crucial to remember that this account of what happened was given to Bonnie's friends, who decided to send her home by partygoers. They recorded the phone number of the cab driver who had taken them there, and at 3.54 a.m., she called him to request a ride to take the Bonnie home. When the taxi arrived at the spot, Dabani climbed into the back seat alone, leaving her pals behind. They approached Cigar and spoke with the driver there. The interior of the automobile is illuminated in the following recording, which was made only 20 minutes later and 100 meters from where Devana boarded the taxi. The Bonnie appeared to be fighting with the driver while already seated in the front seat. She was found to be unwilling to depart and the taxi. The cabbie tried to phone her friend for assistance, but he was ignored. He sent her a WhatsApp message warning her that she was acting aggressively and refusing to leave at 4.25 a.m. and that he didn't know Devani's specific address. The taxi driver let Devani's companion know that she got out of the vehicle. He snapped a photo, the same one that depicts Bonnie standing in the middle of the road, as proof. The taxi driver pleaded with Bonnie's companion to visit or call the girl's parents frequently, but she refused. Devani's buddy ignored the taxi driver's request to gather because there was only 400 meters between where she got into the car and where the picture was taken. The cab driver made several futile attempts to contact your pal before being forced to leave. But before he left, he sent her a message explaining that he couldn't force Devani back into the car since he didn't want any issue or charges of kidnapping or other such behavior. After Devani vanished and this picture was released, rumors started to circulate. The young woman had gotten out of the cab because the driver was harassing her, he claimed. The taxi driver was questioned by the authorities numerous times. He searched his car and phone, but could find no evidence linking him to the young woman's abduction. The taxi driver left the young woman and fled, according to video that the police were able to retrieve from a transportation company's security camera. Dabani was seen in the video standing in front of a camera that was pointed at the road. About 50 meters from the camera, a woman can be seen standing on the road for a while. It's hard to say if she was conscious of what she was doing at the time. But shortly Bonnie begins to approach the camera. There doesn't seem to be anyone pursuing her when she arrives at it at 4.30, as shown by the timestamp. Knowing where Bonnie was last seen. The region where she was last seen was the focus of the search. Police reports state that Bonnie didn't step foot on the transportation company's property. A motel around 150 meters away from the transportation provider also had security cameras put there. However, as law enforcement officials noted, no recordings were created from these cameras because they were solely used for real-time observation of the location. Police and volunteers meticulously investigated the area of the transportation company the motel, all nearby streets, and vacant lots, but no signs of the body were discovered. 100,000 pesos, or around $5,000 US was offered as a reward, was made in exchange for any details that would help with the investigation. Bonnie's body was discovered on the grounds of the motel, only 100 meters from where she had been last seen. One week after she vanished and after 12 days of assiduous searching by family volunteers and law enforcement. It is important to note that despite several searches by the authorities in the motel vicinity, the body was still missing on April 21st, when the motel personnel noticed a pungent odor coming from an abandoned building. They themselves alerted the police from an underground tank where the body was later found. Let's examine the motel and its surroundings in more detail so that you can determine which tank is being discussed. There is a round building. These are the motel's primary structures, including the restaurant, which has been closed for a number of years, and the pool, which has not been used in a long time. There is only one entry from the road, and the entire area is cordoned off with barbed wire. The subterranean tank where Damani's body was is here, close to the wall. A lid covers the first tank, which has two openings that were both open, and the body was removed from the second tank, 
which has two entrances that were both open. The tank has a depth of four meters, 43 semi-nameters from top to bottom, and it is divided into two portions by a 20 centimeter partition within. At the time the body was found, the water level in the tank was 90 centimeters deep in both portions. It's also vital to remember that the interior barrier of the tank is not completely solid. The right and left sides of the tank are connected by a 23 centimeter wide channel. We shall come back to this point in a moment. Even more oddities started to show up as soon as Dibani's body was found. The young woman's body was recovered from the water, but experts determined that the cause of death was a cranial brain damage in the forehead region, which might have been brought on by a fall into the cistern. The police quickly come to the conclusion that the occurrence was an accident. Accident. It was also found that the death occurred between five days and two weeks ago. Nevertheless, the father of the deceased did not accept the accident explanation and was perplexed as to why the police, who had searched the motel area numerous times, had not discovered the body of his daughter earlier. The Attorney General's Office of Nuevo Leon removed the special prosecutor in charge of missing person cases in response to these accusations, claiming carelessness and mistakes in the investigation. However, the prosecutor was present before dismissed recordings from two other security cameras, one at the motel reception and the other inside the vacant restaurant, also came to light. The police had previously asserted that the motel cameras only functioned in real time and did not record any images. We'll look at these recordings after I remind you that it was 4.30 when Devani was found on the road. The motel property was 150 meters away from the restaurant's entrance. Dabani walked peacefully toward the transport firm, and no one was chasing after her. However, she stormed into the motel's grounds five minutes later, as if someone were after her. Devani was seen jogging alongside the restaurant by the camera that was placed across from the entrance. No one can be seen chasing her in the section of the film that the authorities released. Therefore, it can be assumed that something happened when she arrived at the gate to the transportation company. Anything compelled her to flee. The second recording is for my restaurant camera. We must first comprehend the area that this camera can catch before we can comprehend the locations where the body is visible in the video. Consequently, the door leading to the road is located in the upper right corner, and this glass door leads to the inner courtyard. You can only get to it by traveling around the restaurant at 4 and 35 and 31 seconds without climbing over the barbed wire gate. Bonnie may be seen rushing toward the entrance to the she fled inside the motel grounds on the footage at 4.36 after running to the street, as we've observed before. Bonnie moves closer to the glass door and peers inside before moving on to the spot where the fence edge meets the restaurant structure. She seemed to have spent the last 20 minutes cowering in a corner, concealing. Throughout those 20 minutes, nobody approached her. At 4.56, Bonnie comes around the corner and proceeds along the fence, eventually arriving at those cisterns. The official accounts of what happened state that the body stumbled and smacked her head when she lost consciousness of the open cistern in the shadows. The injury was in the area of the forehead, as was already indicated. If the young lady did really fall down by mistake, it is more likely that she did so after hitting her heed. She would have leaned forward out of inertia had she taken a step without feeling the earth beneath her. The officials released an accelerated recording that lasted more than an hour to prove that nobody else was visible in this camera's field of vision. Upon careful observation at our F-456, the body emerged from the corner and proceeded along the fences. At 5.44, 30 seconds later, a shadow flickered on the door. At 5.47, 11 seconds, a car stopped opposite the door leading to the street. 12 seconds later, a silhouette of a person appeared next to that door. At 5.47, 44 seconds later, the car left. At 6.12, 14 seconds later, another shadow flickered on the door leading to the inner courtyard. To ascertain if someone was pursuing the recording, all available recordings are included below. Bonnie. According to the prosecutor's account, the police withheld the recordings from the video camera at the motel reception 
which would require examination. Since Bonnie couldn't see the open cistern lids in the darkness, she fell and suffered a serious head injury that finally caused her death. Damani would have encountered three cisterns on her way to the cisterns. The first one would have been closed, followed by two open lids, but her body wasn't discovered there. The third one, but considering the circumstances surrounding the discovery of the body in the second, there were whispers going around that the young woman had been murdered before being put into the cistern. The authorities made evidence that suggested Damani was alive after falling into the cistern public in order to disprove these rumors. Her shoes and a scrap of cloth were also found there, along with her body, which was recovered in the left portion of the cistern. Furthermore, the wall that separates needs to be highlighted. Dividing the cistern in half, its width is 20 centimeters and its height is 2 meters and 13 centimeters. The body's pocketbook, her face mask, and a white bra were discovered on top of the barrier. It is vital to realize that the only way to place anything on this barrier is to stoop down into the cistern. Since there is no way to go down or up inside the cistern, nothing can be placed on the barrier from the outside. The fact that Bonnie placed the items suggests that she was alive for a while, according to the officials. It is unclear whether Bonnie could have placed her belongings on the two meter, 13 centimeter high partition or if she threw them there. This suggests that Devani herself threw the items on the partition, a lighter and a set of three keys. Unfortunately, information regarding Bonnie's height could not be found. The appropriate area of the cistern contained both her phone and pocketbook. Although we can only guess as to what exactly transpired, if the body did fall and strike her in the head, she would have been bewildered, particularly given that it was dark. The barrier may have opened when she opted to toss her purse on it, allowing some of the contents to fall and land in the second half of the cistern. Devani's bra situation that evening is likewise unknown, as is whether or not it was in her purse. It's also not clear if she had a bra on that particular evening, or if it was in her handbag. It's also crucial to remember that she was dressed when her body was discovered. On one of the TV shows, the person's friends who she went to the party with said that she was intoxicated and that some people tried to take advantage of her, decided to send her home by calling a taxi. Right now, everything evidence points to the case being concluded and the death being classified as an accident. Damani's father disagrees with this account, and he thinks that someone was involved in his daughter's passing. The parents performed an independent examination after receiving the body, but the findings have not been made public. Mario Escobar claims that his future course of action depends on whether or not the authorities decide to keep looking into Bonnie's death or rule it out as an accident. What are your thoughts on this incident? Do you think it was a terrible accident or a criminal act? Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like it. Thanks for watching. A young woman never made it home after leaving work with plans to pick up her son and take him shopping. Her abandoned automobile was discovered five hours later, the door open, headlights on, and engine running, close to another town. When the truth was eventually revealed, the police launched a search and the case quickly took a very unexpected turn. Even seasoned investigators were taken aback. They had not anticipated finding the truth in the manner that they did, nor did they anticipate such a resolution. On October 27, 1972, in the American city of Decatur, Illinois, Karen Slover was born. She met Michael Slover, her future husband, at Richland Community College after graduating from high school. Their son Colton was born less than a year after they were married in 1992, following their time in college. The pair had to put in a lot of work to provide for their child's needs, as well as their own. Karen had to return to work a few days after giving birth because of this. Michael spent the most of his working days with his parents, who had volunteered to look after the child. Karen worked at a number of different places over the ensuing years before settling on the local newspaper, worked in the advertising division, was able to rapidly establish a rapport with the team, and was generally happy with her position. The pair's relationship started to go south a few years after the birth of their son. Karen told acquaintances that Michael would frequently lose his cool and strike her when they were arguing. She chose to seek for divorce as a result, and the court granted her custody of Colton. 
Nevertheless, her pay from the newspaper did not allow her to employ a babysitter for her child. Thus, she was unable to do so. The parents of Michael consented to go on, covering for her at work while she was with him. She started dating David Swan after the divorce. The two of them lived apart, but they were in regular contact. In 1996, when her kid was three years old, Swan and her son got along well and had no significant issues in their connection. Karen started to consider relocating to a different location and attempting a career as a model. She began searching for positions that would suit her needs, and shortly after, she got an invitation from a significant modeling agency in Georgia. The relocation had been much anticipated by her. But on September 27th, she worked at the editorial office until the very last minute to save money for her first date with her son. At approximately 5 o'clock in the evening, Karen told her co-workers that she would be picking up Colton from his grandparents and taking him to the mall. Karen never picked up her son that evening, despite the woman's plans to attend her acquaintance's wedding and her desire to purchase a suitable attire. The woman went gone for several hours at this point. She didn't get in touch with roughly 10 p.m. That evening, a patrolman in the vicinity of Champaign, Illinois, saw a suspicious-looking vehicle parked on the shoulder of Highway 72. The headlights were on, the engine was running, and the driver's door was open. When the police got closer, he saw that no one was inside the car or in the vicinity, contrary to his first assumption that the driver was attempting to address the car's issues. The cops discovered Karen's documents in a woman's purse inside the vehicle, a box of food from a cafe and a half-eaten chocolate bar. Everything suggested that the woman had just gotten out of the car and was going to be back any moment, but she was nowhere to be seen. When the police looked up the license plates on the vehicle, they discovered David Swan was the owner. When he got in touch with him, he found out that Karen had borrowed the man's car while hers was being fixed. According to him, the mother was scheduled to pick up her son from her grandparents that evening. So as the automobile was being brought to the police station, investigators went to their house. Police station, where it was examined more thoroughly by the forensic specialists. The woman was scheduled to arrive soon after work according to the parents of Karen's ex-husband, but she didn't show up at all during the day. There was still Colton, and his mother could not have abandoned him. The police started to think that the automobile theft did not go through as planned, or that the woman might have been taken. The placement of the car was determined to be inconsistent with the events of that evening, which was observed by detectives right away. Karen went to her after leaving the office, before heading to the store, Osmond used to live with his parents. She had the wisdom to find her automobile about 60 kilometers away. This implied that a criminal might have placed the car there in an attempt to confound authorities. The woman herself had to pick up her kid and get ready for a wedding that was scheduled for the following day, so she could not have ended up close to another city. As experts searched the vehicle for any traces, such fingerprints, Police chose to speak with staff members at shops, salons, and hair salons. Prescience. They went there the following day and showed them pictures of Karen, but nobody had seen her. Although fingerprints were not found in the car, forensic specialists thought something was off. Cement residues were discovered on the passenger seat, although Ash David Swan said they weren't there when he gave the car to his girlfriend. Questions were also raised when multiple tall grass stocks were discovered in the salon. There were a few loose coins inside the automobile, which was parked on an unvegetated section of the road. However, it did not produce a lot of credible leads. Following word of Karen's disappearance, friends, family, and co-workers launched extensive searches. While some groups went door to door in the city, others put out flyers along the route where her car was discovered. The women worked for a newspaper, and the management offered a prize of $10,000 for information leading to her location. However, as of October 1st, none of this worked. After receiving a worrisome call, fishermen observed the 50 kilometer from Decatur on the coast of Lake Shelbyville is a waste bag. They opted to carry it with them to dispose of later because they thought it odd that someone had left trash in such an abandoned area. The men soon discovered, though, that it was far from trash. The fishermen made the decision to examine the contents of the bag because it was heavy 
and well sealed with tape. The sight of a woman's head inside startled them. The moment the investigators realized that Karen might be the victim, they asked to see her dental records, prove her identity. Their suspicions were validated. The head really belonged to her. As this was going on, divers and police combed the water, quickly discovering multiple other bags containing additional portions of Karen's body. Medical professionals determined that the woman died from seven gunshot wounds. Following the unidentified perpetrator's dismemberment of her body, possibly with a gasoline saw, her body was placed in bags with an extra chunk of concrete added for weight. Investigators surmised that the murderer hurled the pieces from a lakeside bridge. They even discovered prints on the railings. But these fragments were insufficient for a comparative analysis. Even after a few more packages turned up and washed up on the coast in the days that followed, the authorities were still unable to locate every portion of the victim's body. Investigators deduced that the person who killed Karen was probably someone who knew the victim well and harbored hatred for her, given the ferocity of her murder. This clarified why the offender used a seven shots in all. Because of this, they started searching her close friends and acquaintances for potential possibilities. Detectives were informed by the woman's friends that her ex-husband had threatened and occasionally physically assaulted Karen during their disagreements. The detectives chose to question him after this immediately raised concerns. Michael claimed to have spent the entire day at his three jobs as a bar bouncer, a karate instructor, and a security guard at a supermarket store. The man left the business after his shift. He worked out at the gym right away at around three o'clock in the afternoon. He then went home, showered, and headed straight out to work at the bar. Upon thorough investigation, the man's account was found to be credible, and his alibi held up for the entire day. Michael was seen by many at all three of his jobs, and the investigator even noted the precise moment when Karen left work, and her car was discovered. This gave Michael a strong alibi for the whole day, and eliminated him from the investigation. As that happened, everything became a lot more intriguing. It was discovered that David Swan had been arrested for violence in the past and had also pretended to be a police officer. In addition, the man's mental health issues resulted in his being admitted to a mental health facility following the disappearance of his fiancée. He took an active part in the hunt and never passed up the chance to speak with reporters and do interviews. The police saw this as a little suspect action as David attempted to draw as much attention to himself as potential. They surmised that the man was attempting to avoid being suspected, which is common when the murderer is a close relative of the victim. This individual may be the most involved in the media, urging the authorities to apprehend the offender and maintaining a central position during the entire inquiry. David also gave false information to his acquaintances on his relationship with Karen. He informed them that they will soon tie the knot, but according to her pal, the couple had only been dating for a month and Karen wasn't even considering getting married. Investigators also discovered at this point that David was the owner of a chainsaw, which he occasionally used to butcher deer after hunting. Considering that Karen's body was mutilated in a like fashion, this served to confirm suspicions against him. Apart from that, the man had a gun the same caliber that was used to murder the deceased, but the biggest problem was that he had an alibi for the night the woman vanished. David was scheduled to serve as a chauffeur at his friend's wedding, but he arrived significantly late. Consequently, the man was without an alibi for approximately 45 minutes, during which time Karen was murdered. With everything taken into consideration, the investigators came very close to concluding that he was the murderer. The individual was interrogated for almost four hours in an attempt to extract a confession. The police heard something intriguing when he started to recount all he had done that night. After David claimed to have taken money out of an ATM, the detectives asked to see footage from the device's camera right away. They were shocked to learn that this narrative was true. David did take out a cash withdrawal at the time to complete his alibi. Immediately all suspicions were removed from the man since he was physically unable to kill Karen and drive the car to another city. 
the detectives had very much ran out of leads by this point. One additional action that might eventually lead them to the murderer was taken. In the city proper, tall grass like the kind in Karen's car was frequently discovered abandoned or on outskirts parcels of land. It was continuously cut down as mandated by law. The police spoke with locals as they strolled about the city's periphery, urging them to report any unusual activity they may have noticed. In an attempt to identify further suspects, the investigators persisted in questioning Karen's friends and family. It was revealed to them that the woman's relationship with her ex-mother-in-law had not always been cordial. Even though her grandson had a mother of his own, Jeanette Slover was quite close to him and did not want to part with him. The oddest revelation was still to come. Jeanette appeared to view Colton as her own child rather than her grandchild, and Karen occasionally had to physically remove him from their home. After learning that Jeanette had periodically given Colton the runaround, the police decided to re-interview Slover and get a closer look at her. Jeanette stated that she had spent the entire day at home with her grandson and that when Karen failed to arrive at the scheduled time, she attempted to contact her on their home phone. Moment, but the woman chose not to respond. After requesting call logs from their residence, the authorities discovered that Slover had never spoken to Karen on that particular day. Instead, their phone had made numerous outgoing calls to their son Michael's number. Less than an hour had passed since Karen's ex-father-in-law left the house to buy Colton toys at a nearby store, he told the police. Upon verifying this information, the inspectors discovered that the business had never carried toys made by that particular manufacturer. The man's absence around the time of Karen's death raised suspicions. The investigators started to take Slover's involvement seriously and even came up with a potential reason. Considering how devoted Jeanette was to Colton, the victim was preparing to relocate to another state to pursue a career as a model, and her son would have followed her. Theoretically, she might have killed him to prevent him from leaving her. It was also discovered by the investigators that Slover owned an automobile company. They had a sizable piece of property that was turned into a used car parking lot, but it has been mostly idle for a number of years. Similar to the ones that had been found in bags containing pieces of Karen's remains, the area was strewn with broken concrete blocks when the police arrived after obtaining a search warrant. The detectives were unable to verify that they were the same blogs, though. Furthermore, they hired a lawyer after failing to locate any proof and refusing to speak with the police any longer. At that point, the inquiry had stopped because the investigators had no more leads. It wasn't until 1998, two years later, that it was picked up again by a different group of investigators who wanted to look into the area Slover's shop was located in. They thought that Karen might have been murdered there and that there had to have been some proof left. Regarding the Slover family, they had all relocated to a different state during that period. Colton was residing with them prior to the relocation, having been put up by Michael's sister Mary. Hired repair workers. This worried corporations, but cops demanded proof. In 1998, forensic experts and military installation authorities assisted investigators in their second hunt. They needed as many personnel as possible to cover every square inch in six months. They inspected each stone's top layer for blood before fruiting. Karen wore rivets and a button in her jeans on murder day. After that, she found another blouse button. This supported the police's argument that the woman's body was sliced and stored on business property. While their daughter Mary watched Colton, investigators suspected Jeanette and her husband. Jeanette shot Karen directly when she picked up her son. Karen and her husband brought her body to their shop, but not the buttons. The police determined Karen's ex-husband cut the lawn the night of the murder after talking to every neighbor. Only the investigator's version was supported. Jeanette and her husband drove Karen's car into beautiful grass from the city. Michael knew and helped his parents hide the crime. The grass inside the car may have confused investigators. Another witness told detectives the Slovers burnt something on the premises the day of the murder. They disposed of evidence this way and more. Karen's body was found in the packages with the most horrible evidence, shocking the police. Slover and a dog shed black hair on the cassette. A warrant was issued after investigators sampled the Slover's black, Labrador's dog brush. 
Police found a complete DNA match in the brush, corroborating the family's case. Jeanette and her husband strengthened their relationship for everyone. They hurried to sleep their dog out of fear it was engaged in the crime, but it was too late. On January 27, 2000, officials arrested Jeanette, her husband, and her son after this proof. All three were accused of murder. Although the family denied it, trials lasted until 2002. Jury convicted them despite evidence and testimony. Michael, his father, and Jeanette earned 65 and 60 years in prison in 2003. Judge rejected their appeal. The story seemed over, but Karen's child had further issues. Mary, Michael's sister, adopted him. The court obtained custody over Karen's parents. Do Mary know about her relative's murder charges? If she watched Colton while her parents stole the body, she may have been an accomplice. Karen's parents kept asking the court for exclusive custody and parental rights for Mary. Following the judge's order, Colton lived with his maternal grandparents in 2003. Mary hated Karen throughout this process, and the court found she sought to make the child forget his biological mother. Mary frequently told acquaintances she hoped her dad was alive. They're all serving time. Jeanette's husband and son can be released after 2030, but she can be released early in 2029 at 80. They fail to appeal the verdict and claim innocence. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like it. Thanks for watching.